So I'm getting into a new series today we're simply calling Red Letters. And red letters is referring to the words of Jesus in the Bible. Most Bibles I pick up in the English, in English language have red letters when it comes to the words of Jesus. And so there are so many great and amazing things that Jesus said. This has been a difficult series to try to figure out what I'm doing because there's so many good things and so many good options. But I'm just going to pick out a few statements of Jesus that are well known that I want to dig into a little bit further and let them speak to us. So today I'm going to the book of John chapter 8 and I'm pulling out this one statement from Jesus. Maybe you've heard it before and that is this. He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at first. He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at first. Or just a common uh, phrase that we have in English, you know, he who is without sin, cast the first stone. Maybe you've heard that. Well, I want to read the whole context of this today, and it really shows us something powerful about Jesus and his ministry to us. So John chapter 8, verse 1, Jesus goes to the Mount of Olives, and the Bible says, Now early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day, brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone first at her. And again he stooped down, wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it being convicted by their conscience went out one by one, beginning with the oldest even to the last, and Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? And she said, No one, Lord. Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. What a beautiful story. What a profound story of the forgiving power of God. But the Gospel of John is a really spiritual gospel. Now I know you may be saying, yeah, all the gospels are spiritual. Yeah, but the way John writes, he writes in a spiritual way. That is, he has dualism going all throughout his gospel. Often he and someone would be talking about something on the natural, but they would totally misread Jesus because he's speaking on the spiritual. For example, John chapter 3, the religious leader Nicodemus comes to him and Nicodemus asks him about the kingdom of God and about God. And Jesus said, you must be born again, speaking on the spiritual. And Nicodemus said, how can I go back into my mother's womb and be born again? He's thinking on the natural. Or Jesus, when he encountered the woman at the well in Samaria, he said, lady, I have water to drink of that if you drink of this water, you'll never thirst again. He's thinking on the spiritual and speaking on the spiritual. And the lady responds, how can I get this water? And she's thinking on the natural. And so you have this beautiful, this beautiful spiritual gospel happening. And I think the same thing is happening with this story. Because in the next verse, in verse 12, John says this, Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Now let's work through this passage, and I'm going, to, I'm going to show you how those two pieces fit together, okay? So I think there's something far more profound going on here than we realize. Okay, so let's go to the context of the story. First of all, the Bible says a sinful woman is brought to Jesus. A woman who was caught in the act of adultery. Jesus is trying to teach in the temple courts and he's on that temple mount doing his thing 
And then these scribes and Pharisees bring him this woman in the open to make the biggest public spectacle of this thing that they possibly could. They brought her in the midst of, of these people crowded in the Temple Mount and Jesus teaching. And, it's, and, and as one Bible scholar said, he said, all the indications are that her accusers had some special vindictiveness against her. It's shown in the fact that they brought her out publicly. There was no need for this. And she might have been kept in custody while the case was referred to Jesus, but they wanted to make a spectacle of it. And the word caught, she was caught in the very act, John says. And the, the perfect tense in the Greek here refers to it, it, the continual characteristic of her committing adultery. In other words, it seems from the language that she was, this wasn't her first time. It seems from the language that she was an adulteress. And maybe people knew her as an adulteress. And so they wanted to humiliate her and they wanted to trap Jesus. Okay? But what's interestingly missing from this scene is another man. Because you can't commit adultery by yourself. It takes a partner. And what's interestingly enough missing is a man. And, it, and it, so it looks like it's a setup. It looks like that there were these prearranged spies who went out and witnessed the affair and then brought the lady to Jesus to humiliate her and to entrap Jesus. But according to Jewish law, it was really difficult to convict someone of adultery because you had to have eyewitnesses and you had to have both of them, both of the adulterers caught in the act and then brought before the authorities. So it was very difficult to prove this. But nonetheless, they wanted to humiliate the woman and they wanted to entrap Jesus with his words. You remember in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 22, a similar dilemma happened when they came to Jesus and posed the question about paying taxes to him. They said, should we pay taxes to Caesar? And of course, if he said yes, then the Jews would be mad. And if he said no, then he would be in danger of the Roman authorities. So he simply said, um, look on the coin and tell me whose inscription is on the coin. And they said, well, it's Caesar's inscription. And he said, well, render under Caesar what's Caesar's. So Jesus would never be caught by their attempts at entrapment. But I think what we need to learn from this passage is that Jesus responds in a way that teaches us something about who He is and how He acts toward us. Okay, He responds in a way that really shows us His character and how He acts toward us. So let's look at these ways He responds. First of all, when they come to Him, He ignores them. He literally ignores them. When they come and they're causing all this fuss and they drag this woman into the scene on the Temple Mount, he just kind of ignores them and stoops down and begins writing in the sand. He ignores them and stoops down and begins writing in the sand. Now everyone's had their opinion of what he was writing in the sand and we just don't know is the, is the fact of the matter. Some think that he was just doodling in the dirt he was just random things he was just writing in the sand some think he was just stalling for time others think that maybe Jesus wrote a passage in the law that actually condemned adultery or some think that Jesus wrote the names of all the accusers down or maybe even the sins of the accusers and some think that Jesus followed Roman uh, judicial practice and wrote out the sentence before he actually said it. But we, we actually just don't know. But what strikes me is he ignored them. Why did he ignore them? You know, I think Jesus ignored them because he knew instantly that this whole thing was a sham that this whole thing was a setup, that it was something, even though the, the lady obviously was guilty, and Jesus never excused that, that obviously she was guilty, those Jewish scribes and Pharisees knew they had to bring the man who was caught in adultery also, 
And Jesus knew that they were trying to entrap him into something that he wanted no part of. So I think he just ignored them and let this thing play out because he isn't into petty arguments. What a scene. Accusations flying this way and that way. And Jesus ignores it, stoops down, and writes in the sand. Second thing he does is when he does stand up, he then calls them out in a really profound way. He stands up and says, okay, he who is without sin, let him cast the stone first. If you want to start the ball rolling, guys, you, 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 kick, it into, you kick it into action here. Make it happen, man. Because in Jewish law, witnesses to the capital crime were the ones who were to actually begin the stoning. The ones who were to start the stone throwing were the ones who were the eyewitnesses of what actually happened. So could it be that Jesus was really implying, yeah, we may execute her, but if we're going to execute her, then we're going to do it correctly. And that is one of you guys who actually witnessed this is going to be the first one to cast the stone. You who wanted to humiliate this poor woman, you go ahead and start the process. So, but notice what happens. Instead of passing judgment on the woman, by doing this, Jesus actually passed a judgment upon her accusers. He turned the tables. He didn't say don't execute her. He simply demanded that justice be done in a fair way. Oh, hallelujah. So he didn't excuse her sin, but he called these guys out for what they were doing. Now listen, I've always heard this passage, and, and he who is without sin cast the first stone. That means all of us are sinful. We've all fallen short, and therefore none of us have a right to judge anybody. But as I've looked back at this, I actually don't think that's the correct interpretation. I think what Jesus is really getting at is this. He's saying, you guys are the ones really, she's in the wrong, but you also are in the wrong for the way you're bringing this thing down. And therefore, since you're in the wrong, if you think you should do this, then you who are without sin, you begin it. And they all realized, oh snap, we're all in the wrong here. We're all bringing this in an unfair way. This is unfair, it's not right. And Jesus went to the heart of a common failing in mankind. And that is often we desire to see others punished for their sins while we ignore our own sins. We often want to see the other person punished and get what they deserved, yet we don't want to have to pay for our own sins. Remember the story of David in the Old Testament? King David was a perfect example of this in the book of 2 Samuel. David had committed adultery with Bathsheba, and not only had he committed adultery to Bathsheba, he went one step beyond that, and he had Bathsheba's husband killed in battle to cover up the pregnancy of Bathsheba. And so after having him killed, she brings Bath he brings Bathsheba into his house. And then one day the prophet Nathan shows up. And the prophet Nathan tells a story of a poor man who had a lamb that was taken from him by a greedy man. And, all this, and, and he painted this story. And at the end of it, David stands up in anger and he's like, tell me who it is and I'll have him killed. And then Nathan looks at him and points his finger and says, you're the man. And all of a sudden, David realizes, oh no, it's me. He was willing to call out someone else's sin, but he wasn't willing to deal with his own sin. Oh, are you hearing me this morning, church? Let's get out of this, man. Let's let this story speak to us. And, and bring us to the stark realization that if we call out other people's sins, we better, we better watch. If we're going to throw rocks, we better not live in a glass house. We better watch what's going on. We better protect our own soul. And then what happens after he says, hey guys, you who are without sin, you throw the stone at first. Then he stoops back down again. 
he stoops back down again. And he goes back to his strange way of dealing with this, riding in the dirt. And then time passes, a few moments go by, and he looks up, and all of those accusers have left. The only one left is this poor woman. And Jesus says, hey, what happened to all your accusers? And she says, well, they're gone, Lord. And he says, yeah, neither do I condemn thee. Okay, this is what's happening that I'd never noticed before, and it's so profound. At the end, it says, the lady was standing in the midst. But if you look at the language and the feel of it, some scholars believe that she was actually thrown to the ground. She was standing at the end, but it seems the feel of the text is that she was thrown to the ground. And when Jesus stooped down, it wasn't just that he was ignoring the Pharisees and scribes, but it was also that he was getting down on level with her. I'd never seen this before. But Jesus' way of dealing with this situation was that he didn't excuse the sin because he tells her at, at the end, go and sin no more. He called it sin and he forbade her to do it anymore. So he, he didn't excuse it. But what he did do is he went down and identified with her in her mess. And he got down and identified with her in her humiliation. And he identified with her because the same guys that were trying to entrap her were trying to entrap him. Oh, listen to me, church. This is what Jesus does. He doesn't excuse away our stuff. He doesn't uh, whitewash our sin, but he comes down and he gets in the mess with us and gets in our stuff with us and he brings us out of it. Hallelujah. This is his entire ministry. He came to earth to identify with humankind. He came to earth to get in the mix with us and then pull us out of it. You look into the Old Testament in the book of Isaiah. There are these beautiful these beautiful passages that appear in Isaiah 42 and 49 and Isaiah 50 and Isaiah 52 and 53 that scholars call the servant songs. And what's happening in Isaiah is that the people of Israel and the people of Judah have been carried away to captivity to Assyria first and then to Babylon secondly. And then Isaiah begins prophesying starting in chapter 40 about their deliverance and their coming out of captivity. And then he starts he starts using this term throughout these passages called servant. And he calls Israel the servant of God. But then after a while, this, it, takes, it becomes a personification that now servant is not just Israel anymore, but servant becomes a person. That it's actually like he's prophesying a person will come and will take care of of what Israel couldn't do on her own. So listen to this. Isaiah 42 says, Look at my servant whom I strengthen. He is my chosen one who pleases me. I put my spirit upon him, and he will bring justice to the nations, and he will not shout or raise his voice in public. He will not crush the weakest reed or put out a flickering candle. He will bring justice to all who have been wronged. He will not falter or lose heart until justice prevails throughout the earth. Even distant lands beyond the sea will wait for his instruction. This, is, this has been fulfilled in Jesus Isaiah, 700 years before Jesus came, was seeing the coming of Christ as the ultimate servant of God. And what did he say about him? He would bring one who would bring justice, might I say, social justice. 
He would come and bring justice and make sure that the people on the fringes of society were cared and looked after. Look, he ministers to the Syrophoenician woman. He ministers to the woman with the issue of blood. He ministers to the Samaritan woman. These are untouchables. He ministers to the lepers that no one else would touch. And he even stoops down to the woman caught in adultery and reaches out to her. This is the servant of God from Isaiah chapter 42, the one who would bring justice back to the world. Hallelujah, hallelujah. So the outcast now is taken care of. He's going to come. Philippians 2, Paul talks about it. Paul said, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of man, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself. He came down to us. And became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and every tongue confess of those under the earth. That Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. So he comes all the way down into our stuff so he can rescue us out of our stuff. And lift us up. This is exactly what's happening with the woman caught in adultery. Sure, she's guilty. But she's, she's brought to justice in an unjust way. Surely she's guilty. But he stoops down. And he gets on level with her. And finally at the end looks her in the eyes and says, Woman, <laughs> where are your accusers? Yeah, you know what? I don't condemn you either. You're free. Oh, hallelujah. You're free. You're free. There's another surf, uh, servant psalm. And we see it in Isaiah chapter 53, talking about Jesus as well. 700 years before he would ever come. Isaiah said this, He will be despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. As we hid, as it were, our faces from him, he was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. What that lady didn't realize, who was caught in adultery, that only a few days after this, that he would carry every bit of her sin debt to to Calvary himself and take it upon him and wipe away all of her sin. Hallelujah. Neither do I condemn you because I'm taking your guilt upon me. I'm taking your guilt upon me. Oh, hallelujah. Okay, so what does this have to do with the last verse about Jesus being the light of the world? I mean, how does that work? Okay, here's this story of this woman caught in adultery who they're trying to humiliate her, they're trying to entrap Jesus, and then, you know, beautifully he plays it out and he, he, the, he takes the role of the suffering servant, he takes the role of the servant who brings justice to the world. But then it goes back to, boom, he's back in the temple courts, and he says, I am the light of the world. Okay, what's going on here is that it's a festival time. And at the festival time, several different things happened. The last great day of the feast, Feast of Tabernacles, priests would go down to the, to the Pool of Siloam and would draw living water, fresh water, and bring it back into the temple courts and pour it out. And when he did that, in another, session, another section, Jesus says, I am the living water. I am that water that's poured out. And then something else would happen during the end of that festival time, and that is they would have these candelabra, these menorahs that were maybe 14 feet high, and then they would light them in the evening, and then those menorahs would shine, those candelabras would shine at night. And one Jewish scholar said this, he said, and then the holy men of Israel would dance into the night celebrating the fact that God has come. 
that God has given His law, that God has blessed Israel, that God has illuminated and brought them out of darkness. And I think what Jesus is saying is He's saying, yeah, I am the ultimate fulfillment of the Savior of Israel. I am the ultimate fulfillment of the one who has come down to call people out of darkness. I am the one who's bringing light into the dark. I am the one who's bringing salvation to sin. I'm the one who's bringing uh, resurrection to things that are dead. I'm the one who's piecing together and rebuilding ruined places. I'm the one who's patching back together people's lives that's been destroyed by sin. I'm the light of the world. How is this happening? How is this happening in this, in this scenario? I think John is telling us this all pieces together because now this poor woman who is facing death, marred in sin, possibly a habitual adulterer, Jesus stoops down to and He's telling her, I am the light of the world. You don't have to live like this anymore. And He raises her up out of her bondage, frees her from her sentence to death, and sets her completely free. That's a reason to dance into the night hours and celebrate. Hallelujah. That is a reason to dance on. Woman, where are your accusers? They're all gone. Hallelujah. I am the light of the world. Now let's celebrate. I'm telling you, church, this is exactly what God has done for us. He's come down. Those of us who know Him, those of us who have given our lives to Him, God has come down and He's stooped down to where we are to bring us up out of the sin. And He's forgiven every sin debt. He's wiped away the past. He's exonerated all the guilt. He's taken the punishment and the penalty of hell away from us. And now He's saying, now you're free. I I've come as a light of the world to you and now you can dance on into eternity because I have set you free. Hallelujah. Somebody lift your hands this morning and give God some praise in this house. Years ago, I, I wasn't raised in church and years ago, I, I had growing up, I'd been to church that I could remember two times. Only two times. One with, with one set of my grandparents and, and the other with the other set of grandparents. And so I didn't know anything about church. My mom taught me how to pray when I was young, thank God. I didn't know any scripture. I didn't, you know, we did not attend church. I didn't have any desire to attend church. And then I got really sick when I was 16. I was put in the hospital for a week. And while I was in that hospital, one night... A voice spoke to me. It wasn't an audible voice. It was one of those voices in your heart that you, that you hear. And a voice spoke to me. And at the time, I was just concerned about, you know, being a cool teenager and being cool in high school. And, and, and I kind of wanted to party with my friends and all that. And I heard this voice speak, and this is exactly what the voice said. Hans, you don't have to party anymore. And I thought, okay. But when that voice spoke to me, it was as if I was in a dark room and someone went on over and flipped the light switch on and all the lights came on. It was like illumination happened in my life. Not long after that, I got hungry to go to church and I got hungry to pray. I started praying at home. I started reading the Bible by myself. I eventually went to church. I gave my life to Jesus. I got saved at home. I didn't know how to get saved. I just started kneeling down every day and saying, God, forgive me. I don't want to go to hell. And God saved me right in my home. And, and then it was like, boom. Oh, this is what life's about. Then boom. Oh, I understand what this is. I know I didn't know everything, but it's like someone flipped the light switch and the lights came on in my life. And then I thought, oh no, there's some stuff in here I need to stop doing. There's some stuff I need to get out of my life. Why? Because light came and illuminated all of that. That's what Jesus does. He is the light of the world. He comes and He, he shines the spotlight on illuminates your understanding and calls out all of that bad stuff out of your life. Hallelujah. So you know what? It doesn't matter what other people say. It doesn't matter what other people think. I just want to know what Jesus is saying about me and what Jesus thinks of me. Others are accusing me. Who cares, man? 
Jesus says, there's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. That, that sentence of condemnation has been lifted off of us. Some of you have been trying to live the Christian life and you've been trying to live it by rules and regulations and it's like you're trying to check off the boxes and then one day you have a rough day and you're like, oh no, I've lost it all, I've stumbled and I, it's all over. Well, it's not all over. I'm not, you do have to live right, yeah, sure. But we live right out of grace and we live right out of forgiveness and now that, that sentence of condemnation has been lifted off of us. Some of us were alcoholics and drug addicts and some of us were prisoners and some of us were adulterers and some of us were cheaters but what makes us in common in the church is we've all been forgiven and all of our accusers have nothing to say anymore because Jesus has come and he stooped down to where we are and he's pulled us up and brought us out. <laughs> Hallelujah. Come on, somebody lift your hands in here this morning and just give him some praise and just shout an amen for me. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. He who is without sin, you cast the first stone. In other words, if you're going to trump up charges and you're going to make this thing not, not equally just, then you start the ball rolling. Hallelujah. Wouldn't we love Jesus to speak into the political system of our day? Wouldn't we love him to speak into the judicial system of our day? Hallelujah. He's called us to be light and he's called us to be salt in the earth so that we live according to his precepts and represent who he is. Hallelujah. I just want you to lift your hands right now and thank God that he came down to where you were. That he came down and rescued you. Come on, just lift your hand. Maybe you're not comfortable with it, but just go ahead. Don't worry about those who are around you. Just lift your hands right now and give him some thanks and give him praise for coming down to where you are and lifting you out of that stuff you're in. Some of you have been struggling this morning with situations and you're thinking, man, where is God in this thing? Where is, I've prayed about this. Listen, you may not feel him, but I guarantee you he's walking with you right where you you are. He's already in the stuff with you. Just go ahead and begin praising Him that He's going to bring you out of this stuff. <laughs> go ahead and lift your hands right now and begin thanking Him that He's going to bring you out of this mess. Hallelujah. He's not forgotten you. He knows exactly where you are. He knows your name. He knows every hair on your head. It's numbered. Everything, every, everything He cares about. Every hurt that's been done to you, He knows about. He's got a record of it all. You just need to lift your your hands right now. Close your eyes and just start praising Him. Just start giving Him thanks right now in Jesus' name. Hey guys, thanks so much for watching or listening to our podcast. I'm so honored that you tuned in and I pray the sermon was a great blessing to you. I don't know where you are right now in life, but I know one thing. God loves you and He has a plan for your life. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ into your heart, how about praying this prayer with me, opening up your heart, and inviting the Lord to come in? Come on, just a simple prayer. The Bible says, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Are you one of those whosoevers? If so, open up your heart right now and just pray with me. Just say, Father in heaven, I accept Jesus Christ into my life. Forgive me of all my sin and give me a new start today. In Jesus' name I pray, and you can say amen where you are. Please join us online for more information. We hope you come back and visit us, and we love you dearly. And go follow God and go into the destiny that he has for your life.